Hey guys, it's Leanna. I'm here today with a list of my all-time favorite books of all time. I posted a poll uh, asking what, what, what movie, what video you guys would most like to see from me, and the winner, hands down, was my all-time favorite books, which surprised me, because y'all always like it when I rant, and all-time favorite books is an entirely positive video, so thank you for wanting to see me be happy. <laughs> this list is obviously as of now. Over the course of my lifetime, this list is subject to change. So I'll, uh, maybe I'll film a video like this again in a year or two years. No, who knows? <laughs> but as of right now, as of what I have read to date, as of who I am this day, these are my favorite books of all time. I narrowed it to 10. So I have other favorite books, but I had to narrow it somehow. And I decided 10 is a nice round number without being like, I couldn't do top three because I would just like have an aneurysm. 10 was still painful to do because there's other books that there are still books that I love that I would love to have been able to talk about but if I had to push comes to shove pick 10 these are the 10 but these are not ranked so it's not like 10th favorite to first favorite because I can't I just cannot so these are in no particular order these are the order that I wrote them down is that's it so the first but not potentially number one but but no not officially is The Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss no one is surprised this is I literally have a shelf that's like 15 copies of King Killer books. I'm obsessed. I've loved this book since I first read it. I picked it up randomly and I loved that that was random because I had zero expectations. It was just this gem that I just discovered. I just found it, half price books, a mass market paperback for like $2, read it as my commute book and was just like, this book is amazing. And then made my coworker read it and she was like, this book? is amazing. And I was like, yeah, it fucking is. And got more people to read it. Talked to my dad, found out he had already read it. And I was like, then why didn't you recommend it to me? Why are you holding out on me? Got my brother to read it. He loved it. And then discovered booktube and discovered that a lot of people have read it and a lot of people love it. And I was just like, oh, okay. So this is like a thing. Like people are aware of it. <laughs> I just wasn't. But I'm glad it wasn't the other way around because whenever you go into something that's pre-hyped for you, you run the risk of being disappointed. So I loved that it was just like this random book that I thought would pass the time on the bus. And I was just like missing my stop every day when I was reading it because I was just so invested. And to this day, I have not read anything that's quite been that. <laughs> I've read a lot of good books. I've read a lot of lyrical, beautiful prose. But none of it is quite the magic of Patrick Rothfuss's writing. And he needs to fucking finish that trilogy because, you know, just, come on, come on. Next, again, is not going to be any shock to anybody, is The Wolf by Leo Carew, which I have read three times and intend to read more in my lifetime. I've talked about this book a lot, which is why I don't feel like I, I need to say a lot. But if you've never seen my channel or never seen me talk about it before, The Wolf is an imagined history, alternate history fantasy uh, that takes place in our world but asks the question what would our world be like if if we were not the only humanoid species to survive the ice age so it takes place in a medieval kind of period but there are other humanoid species occupying europe and we follow primarily those non-humans the anakim the black lord roper who has recently come into power because his father was killed in battle by the southerners which are humans and he has now come into power and he has to navigate suddenly having a position of power when a bunch of people are very clearly conspiring against him because they don't think he should rule because he's very young. The world that Leo Peru created, the way that he did the work of imagining what Neanderthal would be like if it developed to have language and culture, and the way that he, he crafted the politics and the history and, again, the culture, the language. There's language that the Anakim speak where it, it goes into how they have words for things that we do not have words for because you're just always telling about a people because if a people has a word for it, that means that something, it, it shows something about their thought process. So he's just done such an anthropological job of fleshing out these people in this world and, and still written a really intensely interesting battle-centric political conspiracy-laden plot. Ugh, absolutely designed to be my favorite thing in the world. So good. And the second book, The Spider, is just as good if not better. And I believe he's in the process of writing book three. And I have every reason to expect it to be fantastic because he has not let me down. Oh, oh, so good. Next is A Little Hatred by Joe Abercrombie. Joe Abercrombie is one of my all-time favorite authors. That's my favorite thing he's ever written. So I don't think I need to go super into that. He's, I love the world of the first law. I love what he's done with the world. Best of Cold was my favorite until I read A Little Hatred. But A Little Hatred, not only do I think it's better than Best of Cold, it's also, I think, the most... I don't even know how to say it. like Best of Cold was the best one in the first law as far as I was concerned. It was most interesting and engaging and enjoyable and, and I loved it. But it wasn't so 
groundbreaking and unique. A little hatred is everything that I love about the world of the first law and the best at being that. But he's also pushed his world into an industrial age, so he's done something that most fantasies don't do, where you've taken a world and you've progressed it into where technology is, is developing and economy is developing and social structures are developing and pushing it into this more industrial age while still being in the world of the first law, still having characters that you recognize from the original books and oh, the plotting of it, the pacing of it, the everything of it is just chef's kiss. It's so fucking good. Oh, it's masterful. It's so artfully crafted. It's fucking fantastic. <laughs> Next is The Lies of Locke Lamora by Scott Lynch, which is right up there with like The Name of the Wind. It was it was an, actually another commute book that I picked up randomly and read and loved and made my coworker read. <laughs> and then discovered that there are other fans. Very similar experience as Name of the Wind. Not quite that kind of like, oh my god, wow, The Name of the Wind, but still like really, really good. And I haven't really found another like crew of heisters bantering that matches the level of the Lies of Locke Lamora, The Gentleman Bastards. Whenever I hear people say, oh, if you love The Lies of Locke Lamora, then you should read this, and I'm always let down. It's never quite that level. The snark and the banter, especially throughout the series, it gets better and better, but the first book is so iconic, and it's, it's an exciting and fast-paced plot that has really great world-building. The characters are really interesting and fun and funny, and also, like, completely rips your heart out with, like, where the plot goes, and I think the, the Venetian-inspired world, and I, I think the whole thing is so lush and so fun and so engaging, and I just, I love being in the world of Camor. And I just, I haven't read about another crew that does it for me, like the Gentleman Bastards. However, next on the list is something that is frequently compared to Lies of Locke Lamora, and that is Six of Crows. However, I think that comparison does both books a disservice, because my the, the satisfaction I derive from each is very different. Lies of Locke Lamora has that heisting, bantery thing, and like, yes, there's that like, group dynamic, and I guess in that sense, the books are similar. But what I'm getting out of Six of Crows is the representation of all these people from really diverse backgrounds, the representation of people who are slightly differently abled. Kaz is physically disabled. Wylan has, um, uh, a, I guess, a learning disability? I don't actually know. I'm not <laughs> educated or informed enough to be able to talk about this, to articulate what is being represented there. But I and mean, you have a really, again, a really diverse and complex group of characters that is, you don't see that often in YA. They have a lot of emotional baggage that does not define them and yet is important to who they are. And then you also still have this great epic world with an interesting heist and fun banter. And it, it's an all around good time. But just the work that she's put into creating these characters and the messiness of each one and how that works and doesn't work and how it affects them and doesn't affect them and emotional and physical traumas and the toll they take and I just think it's the character work that's being done for these young people is I haven't really seen it in any other YA done to that degree so I just kudos <laughs> for doing that and I just I mean I love the fuck out of Kaz Brecker let's be real next is Ocean at the End of the Lane by Neil Gaiman Neil Gaiman is my favorite author and Ocean at the End of the Lane is my favorite thing he's ever written so enough said <laughs> And Ocean at the End of the Lane is actually a fun book because I shouldn't say actually as though like unlike the others it's there's a fun story behind it because he kind of accidentally wrote it his wife Amanda Palmer who's a singer was away to record an album like film videos for it or just record it or whatever she was out of she was out of the country for that and he was going to write her something for while she's gone like to send to her because she'd miss him and he was just going to write her a short story and he asked her what she wanted and she said, you never put yourself in your stories. I want you to write something with you in it. So he started writing a short story and uh, he kind of kept writing it and kept writing it. And then she got, she came back and he still hadn't finished it. And he kept writing it. And he's like, I think I've accidentally written a novelette. And he kind of kept writing it. And he's like, I think I might've accidentally written a novella. And then he kept writing it. And then he contacted his editor, his publisher was like, I think I've accidentally written a novel. Uh, if you're interested in publishing it. It is the only story that really kind of has him in it because it's about this little boy who you can really see like it's probably what Neil Gaiman was like or the way that he remembers himself or thinks of himself as a little boy. And it's this really dark but also utterly fantastical kind of like a few days in the life of this little boy that are being remembered by the old adult version of himself. And one of my favorite things about the story is that arguably the events of the story could be interpreted as childhood trauma and a child explaining something really terrible to themselves in a way that is more palatable by assigning the blame for it to something magical. And the story doesn't like dwell on making you ask that question, but the way it's told, it leaves that room for doubt that 
what happened in this story, which is utterly fantastical and horrific, is not it did not necessarily happen. It might have been in the mind of the child. The way that Neil Gaiman understands the mind of a child, understands the child, a child's perspective on the world, and the way that a child sees the world and engages with the world is so on the nose. And I'm impressed with it every time. He does it in other books too, where he really, the way that a child would interpret something or the things that a child would notice an adult wouldn't. The way that he's able to like zero in on that and describe it in a way that you you didn't think of it because you were an adult, but as soon as he says it, you're like, yeah, that is what it was like being a kid. You're totally right. That's what's changed. <laughs> There's a line in the book where he says uh, that adults follow paths, but children explore or children children creep or something like that. But basically that like, if you look at a garden, an adult sees this path that they're supposed to walk on and they'll look at the flower beds or whatever. A child sees no rules and boundaries. Everything is open for exploration, for crawling on top of it underneath, and they explore every little bit. There's there is no path. And it's one of the most like fundamental differences between how an adult and a child will look at something, and it also carries over into everything else, the way that a child will interpret events. There isn't already a predetermined answer to how to interpret this event. It's all fresh and new and open to horrific possibility. And Neil captures that in a way that I don't think any author, any other author in my experience at least, has been able to do. Next is Radiance by Grace Draven, and that's on this list probably just for the sheer virtue of the number of times that I've read it. I just can't get enough of it. It's it's a romance. It's very short. It's I think it's at or under 300 pages, and there's like zero angst, zero misunderstanding, miscommunication. There's zero questionable crossing of boundaries. It's just two incredibly reasonable people falling in love with each other, and I love hanging out with them so much. It's funny too, and I've talked about this book so many times, just like the others, and I just, I can't get enough of it. Every time I read it, I just get a goofy smile on my face because I love Krishna and Ildiko, because they're, every time I read a, any other story that has a romance in it, when the characters are being like, ridiculous where all of this could be solved if y'all just were honest, if y'all just spoke up and said something. Brishna and Ildiko, without fail, just say it. Anytime they're worried about something, afraid of something, worried that the other one is thinking something, they're not just like bottling it up and getting all like dramatic and angsty and having a misunderstanding that lasts like 10 books. No, that's why the book is like 200 pages because they meet and they're like, well, you know, we're, we both have to marry each other as much as we probably wouldn't want to, but you seem all right. I see him all right. All we really gotta do is live together. So let's be honest with each other and let's make make the best of it. And they do. And she's freaked out by something. He's like, are you freaked out by this? She's like, yeah, kind of like, honestly, I am a little freaked out. He's like, understandable. Um, but you know, I'm here for you. So like, let me know if you get freaked out by stuff. And she's like, yeah, well, you know, we'll do. <laughs> and it's just so reasonable. And they poke fun at each other in a way too, where, you know, he makes, cause they're of different species and he finds her terrifying. She finds him terrifying on the outside but they trust each other. So he's like, please don't do that thing with your eyes. That's completely terrifying. Please don't. And she's like, what, this? <laughs> and his food is like disgusting to her. And she's just like, if I have to make that for dinner, like mm, you, that's not happening. <laughs> and he's like, oh no, you don't want to have that for dinner. Like they poke fun at each other. And they're just like really chill to hang out with. I, I love them. <laughs> and I love that they love each other. And it's just, oh, whenever I want confirmation that there's good in the world, I just read Radiance. Next is Golden Sun by Pierce Brown, which is the second book in the Red Rising trilogy and in the Red Rising saga. It is the book that made me a Red Rising fan. I read Red Rising and the beginning of the book, I was like, oh, this is really, really good. And by the end of the book, I was just like, what? Boring. I don't know that I would have gone on to read the next one. I didn't hate Red Rising, but I was like, eh, it started strong, but eh. And then friends of mine were like, we just read Red Rising together. I think you just finished Red Rising. We're all gonna read Golden Sun. Do you wanna join us? And I was like, Sure. Why the fuck not? And Golden Sun is a game changer. Oh, ho, ho, holy macaroni. That book, whoa, whoa. <laughs> it's just complete next level. Like, did not see any of that coming. Such masterful twists and character building and expansion of the world. And and the other books in the series, obviously I'm a fan of Red Rising and I, he continued to write really good books that continued to keep me a fan. They're all like five star books. but. Golden Sun continues to be the one that is paced the best, that has the most shocking, most incredibly like heart-wrenching and gripping moments, the most, it just has, packs the most punch, where I just, when I read that book, I just was gobsmacked. I was like, what <laughs> did I just read? And I've reread it, and even though I knew the twist's coming, I was just like, holy fuck, this book. So, I mean, I think his writing keeps getting stronger and better. He keeps improving as a writer, but nothing in the reading experience has really topped Golden Sun. 
Um, the last two on this list might be more of a surprise or, or less known to you. And those are first Ivanhoe by Sir Walter Scott, which I don't think I've ever talked about on my channel before, but it is my favorite classic. And it is so under appreciated and I don't understand why. There are so many movie adaptations of all these other classics. There's so many so many people talking about and giving special editions to so many other classics. And Ivanhoe is, is constantly overlooked and I don't understand why. Ivanhoe is is the reason that we got this resurgence of this romanticism. He's the one that brought Robin Hood back into the zeitgeist. He's the one that got us all interested in like knights and crusades and, and all of that again. He, Sir Walter Scott is the reason that we have all that literature. But Ivanhoe is overlooked and forgotten. And Ivanhoe itself, the story, it is filled with a lot of interesting social commentary, a lot of humor, a lot of... I mean, it's a very interesting book and and quite, for its time, quite modern in kind of the things that he incorporates in it and in the character's reactions to things and in the way that he ends it. There's this kind of like wink, wink, nudge, nudge aspect to it. And I just think it's so good. And it's very epic. I just think it would be so good on screen. And there have been adaptations of it. There was one really long time ago with Elizabeth Taylor and uh, I forget who else was in it, but I mean, that's how old it is. And then there was like a made for TV one that was like very low budget with Anthony Andrews. But Ivanhoe deserves to be adapted by like Ridley Scott and have a, a score by Hans Zimmer and and be that. I don't know why it's not. People keep remaking Robin Hood and I'm like, okay, whatever. People keep remaking Pride and Prejudice and I'm like, okay, whatever. But why not Ivanhoe? Why not Ivanhoe? Ivanhoe is such rich material. Oh, it would make such an incredible film. Or because of the higher budgets of TV series now, honestly, it's a really, there's a lot to the book. And I would hate for any of it to be lost. So fuck the Ridley Scott idea. Have HBO adapt it. A miniseries on HBO, Ivanhoe would be fantastic. It's so good and I highly recommend you read it. The book is great, but I don't understand why people don't talk about it, don't read it, and don't adapt it. It's so rich and sweeping and epic and funny and it has everything you could ask for in a book. It's so good. And last but certainly not least is Peter Pan by J.M. Barry. I am obsessed with Peter Pan and for the longest time I was obsessed with Peter Pan without having read it. And I did finally read it a couple years ago and it was the treasure that I always thought it was. And I am still blown away by J.M. Barry's creativity and in a very different way. He's capturing the truth of youth in the way that Neil Gaiman does because neither Neil Gaiman nor J.M. Barry regard children as angelic. <laughs> neither of them, they, they idealize youth, but not in a perfect way. They idealize children, but not in a way that makes them out to be flawless or without sin. Peter Pan is... <laughs> Kind of a monster and the children that populate Neil Gaiman stories are not innocent but there is something inherently different about the way that children view the world about a child a child's perspective on what is important and Peter Pan captures that in a, a completely different way from what Neil Gaiman does I mean, it's more of a fairy tale and yet he has managed to cap I think that's why it stood the test of time because Peter Pan isn't about a perfect sweet spirit of youth that lives forever because he represents all that is good. Like, nope, that is definitely not what it's about. I mean, you do kind of sympathize with Captain Hook at times because you're like, man, to have to deal with this little shit who just won't die and can fly can be pretty fucking aggravating. And like the island of Neverland, like it's not a perfect paradise. It's dangerous and deadly. And that is what excites children. Children are not sweet little angels. They get very interested and excited about dangerous things. They have all these strange thoughts and dark impulses that they don't know how to interpret yet or don't even know they're wrong yet. And so there's this kind of like sinister purity to a child's delight in violence and horror because they don't even know that it's wrong yet. They're living for sheer emotion and delight. It is the purest form of hedonism is a child. And J.M. Barry's story and his world captures that like nothing ever has ever again or ever will. And I love it. For what it is, like the fact of it, I love it, but also just the reading experience because J.M. Barry's writing style is fun and imaginative and filled with imagery and humor. And it's just a fantastic creation. So those are my all time favorite books of all time ever. Let me know in the comments down below what your favorite books are, if any of the books on my list are on your list, if any of the books on my list you are now going to give a try because you're going to add them to your list. If any of the books on my list are your least favorite books of all time and you hate them, you know, let me know that too. Why not? I post bookish videos on Saturdays and as of now I'm posting vlogs on Tuesdays and Thursdays until further notice. So if you enjoyed, please like and subscribe and I'll see you when I see you. Bye.